Hello everybody, this is Nalini Lazowitz with Pickleball Noise Relief. I'm here with Rob Mastriani. How are you doing, Rob? I'm, I'm fine. A little <laughs> awkward now that we're just doing the re-intro, but you know, good. Yes, we, we like to open early and have a little meet and greet, and it's so much fun to uh, to meet the members of the Facebook group that you launched uh, a mere, what, eight weeks ago? Yeah, I think, no, we've made a lot of progress. It's been great. Um, I think, you know, we're getting a lot of attention and it makes me feel good uh, having the targets on our back because it means that we're doing something. Exactly. Uh, I think we're upsetting some people and that's that's a good sign. Well, I, I really think it's a, a very complicated pros, uh, problem, the, the noise from uh, pickleball, and that there's so many different fronts to explore. So we've been hosting the Zoom calls every two weeks. We've gained another 100 members since our last uh, Zoom call. Uh, for anybody who hasn't heard the previous episodes, uh, they are up on SoundCloud, and i um, be happy to put that, chat, uh, that link in the chat. But today I just wanted to um, kick off our guest speaker, Les Blomberg. Uh, we found Les on the internet a few months ago, and uh, he runs the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse. And it wasn't until I got involved with this issue that I realized I'm now a noise activist on top mm -hmm. of all the other environmental issues that I've been involved in. Um, and so this is just going to be a nice conversation with Les. We have a lot to learn and he's brought us some slides. Uh, Rob, unless you have any uh, opening words you'd like to add, um, we could just have Les introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about the organization that you run and uh, how you've managed to keep it afloat for 25 years and all the good work you've done. Yeah, no. Hello, Les. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so my name is Les Blaberg. I'm the executive director of the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse. Uh, we did start um, back about 25 years ago, a little more. Um, and basically, the Noise Pollution Cle Clearinghouse is a nonprofit. And we work to be a resource for the general public regarding noise issues. We're, we're, our focus is to increase uh, awareness of noise pollution and uh, its solutions. And to, um, in my particular expertise, expertise is noise policy. And so uh, I, I write a lot of noise ordinances. I've, I've read, I think I can safely say I've read more noise ordinances than anyone else in the country. I can also safely say, say that nobody else would want to claim that. <laughs> so I think I'm going to have that title for a long time because was, nobody wants to have that job. But um, um, easily uh, thousands of noise ordinance, easily thousands. And, um, and and that's one thing I want to share with you guys today is some of my work in analyzing those noise ordinances. Before I start, I want to I want to start with something that I think it's, it's been it's been something I've been fighting against uh, for 25 years and that is the concept that noise is unwanted sound or the definition of noise is unwanted sound it is the most common definition I hear out there and it is just so wrong I hope that I never hear one of you guys say noise is unwanted sound the, the reason is is because um, you know, well, well, there's many reasons. For for one, um, you know, if if you're if you're if you lose your hearing because you went to too many Who concerts and rock concerts when you were young, it's not the unwanted sound that caused you to lose your hearing, because you went to those concerts and you wanted to listen to it, right? That was wanted sound, right? Unwanted sound makes it sound like this is just kind of some subjective thing, you know, you want it, I don't want it, it's just whoever wants but more, or whatever, who's got more power. And, and that's not true at all. And, and, and so what I want to enforce is that, that noise is a sound that is harmful to people, animals, and ecosystems. It's harmful to the health or well-being of people, animals, or ecosystems. There's other definitions too that are out there. You know, there's some aspect of noise that's unwanted sound, but it's such a small aspect of the noise. I mean, another definition is this: that noise is loud. Um, 
Another one is that it's a, pl a sound that's out of place or a sound that's inharmonious. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these definitions, but there's really only one good one. That, that's the, the really, I think, a good one. And that is the, the one that deals with the health and well-being. And so I encourage you guys to focus on that uh, in any encounter that you have. So with that said, let's let's hop into my slides real quick. And let me tell you a, a bit about um, how I see the best way to regulate pickleball noise. So, um, yeah, you, this is just the introductory slide. Um, yep, there you go. Uh, back up one. So in any noise regulation, there's two really key components, and you really got to keep these in mind. Oh, let me say, please feel free, anybody, just to interrupt at any time with a question, if I'm not clear. Two key components. The one is the law or the ordinance. The other is the enforcement. You can have the best ordinance in the world, and if the police chief is not going to enforce it, it does you no good. You can have a bad noise ordinance, and if the police chief is wanting to do something about the noise, they usually can work with that and do something. Okay? So I can't stress enough how important okay. the um, police and the enforcement aspect of everything is. Um, that said, I'm going to focus primarily on the ordinance uh, end of it today, because um, you have to deal with making the connections with your local police chief and police officer. So, so there's three functions that any noise regulation can, can fulfill, and, and, and you will see each of these in any ordinance that you read. One is to protect the noise polluted, and that's kind of what I'm hoping to create. That's what I hope, I think, what you want to find. Um, another ordinance protects the noise polluter. You know, if you set the noise level high enough, it becomes a license to make noise, a license to pollute. And so just getting a noise regulation isn't enough because if you set the criteria level too high, it's it's really a license to noise pollute on your neighbors. Now, the, the third option is the one that I think is where most noise ordinances come in right now, is they do neither well. <laughs> They don't totally protect the noise polluter, but they don't really protect the, the neighbors either. And and that's something we just always got to be working towards um, to try to, you know, to to get better regulations that actually protect the polluter. Go for or the polluted. Go, okay. The What I did is I surveyed the noise ordinances of the 500 largest cities in the country. Read each one of these ordinances several times had staff read them even more. And we, we, we just looked at every regulatory tool they use in, in, no, in noise ordinance. Um, just a, a little word about the sample size here. There are um, really something like 20,000 jurisdictions in the United States. So the 500 largest cities are all with populations greater than 63,000 people. And so what, what this means is that, that the um, you, you find more decibel-based ordinances in this population than, than in the country in general. Um, a couple things that happen. One is more innovative ordinances come out of local communities. Um, big communities I don't see being very innovative. On the other hand, big communities can actually defend their noise ordinances, where small communities can be easily intimidated somebody with deep pockets. Um, finally, um, you know, urban areas tend to have higher background noise levels and so tend to have higher limits than a suburban or rural community. So just keep that in mind as we go through these. Go ahead. So these are the tools that I found. And, and we'll be coming back to these again. But, um, and, and, and the prevalence of them. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time on them now because I'm going to explain each one of these in a bit. But you can, I think you can kind of get the sense just by looking at, through these. And you can see that they're in a lot of noise regulations. Okay, let's go to the next slide, because we're going to come back to this over and over. Here's where I want to hang a little bit longer. Because what I did is I said, OK, I, what do I think of those regulatory tools? Which ones can apply to pickleball? And this is what I think. 
And this is kind of like still the intro, so to speak. So, you know, you don't have to memorize this, worry about it going by too fast, anything like that. We're going to come back to this and kind of go through this now. But this is kind of give you a heads up. These are the types of restrictions and, and, and regulations that I think you should be aiming for. I can tell you when I write a noise ordinance, I try to put every one of those into my noise ordinance. And I think the reason will become obvious in a little bit. There is no magic solution to noise. And I think the same is true to pickleball. That there is no one regulation. I think you need a lot of them. And I, I think it'll become obvious when we go through my, the rest of my slides. Go ahead. Okay. Don't worry about this. This is busy. We're going to get zoomed in. I want you to get the big... Oh, don't go slower, 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 slower. There you go. I want you to get the big picture here, and then we're going to dive into this. Okay, so go ahead the first one. Just, there you go. So the left-hand side of this graph are the regulatory tools, and we will go through them. Don't worry if you can't read them yet. We're going to see them bigger. Go ahead the next button. The top is the, the various advantages of them, or you could think of them as advantages and disadvantages of each tool, because if it doesn't have an advantage, it's the disadvantage of it. You can notice several gaps in there. Um, and we're going to focus a lot on those gaps because those gaps are the problems. And that's why I use all the regulatory tools I can. Go ahead and hit the next one. What do the X's mean? A big X means that it's an advantage. A little X means it's kind of an advantage. Okay. And what, one thing I can do is I can um, email a version of this so you can have a copy of this that so you can look at yourselves and think about yourselves. But I, I really don't think you're going to need this because when we get to the end, I think you'll see where this is all going. Okay, let's hit the next button. Okay, so I want to just look at the advantages right now and we're going to zoom in on these. Next button. The first advantage I got up there is ease of use. And it's, 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 it involves a number of things. Can a police officer or a zoning official enforce it? Or does it need somebody like me, a noise expert, to do the enforcement? Does it require special training by the, of the police officers? Does it require special equipment? Is it expensive or is it inexpensive? And how long does it take to do an enforcement? Okay, because certain things it takes like an hour to do a noise enforcement. Certain things it takes about two or three minutes to do a noise enforcement. And so, um, this will be advantage or dis disadvantage that's really important. This is really important also, go ahead and hit the next button, because there are about five to ten million calls to police departments every year for noise. And if every noise enforcement action took an hour, it would not work. All right, there's just no way, because, and, and the other thing is, most of these probably come in on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. <laughs> and so, it just would not work. And so you've got to have an easy to use noise regulation. Go ahead with the next button. The next category over is comprehensiveness. And you can kind of peek up above and see where this fits on that screen again. Comprehensiveness, you know, does it address all noise sources? And then specific problems, low frequency noise, impulse noise. Now that's your problem, right? Your problem is impulse noise. We generally define the impulse noise as noise at a duration of less than one second. Okay? And a lot of noise metrics do not address that, especially if you use any averaging in it. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, going on, if there is a tone. Now, you can have a little tonality in that, but really it's the impulse noise that's the issue here. Um, and does it address interior noise? Lots of standards don't address interior noise. Sound level meters can't be used in the rain. So that would be an example of where you can't use it in the rain. They also can't be used in extreme cold. They can't be used in the wind. So can you enforce a noise ordinance in all sorts of weather conditions? If you're in Chicago, it's really hard to use a sound level meter to enforce your noise ordinance some days. Go ahead. The next one, quantitative. Does it provide an objective criteria? This is important, usually when, it, when you get to the courts of law, but it's also important because it's easier to get the police to act when it's a clear um, uh, criteria involved. And uh, legal considerations. It's, 
it's important that a noise regulation is understandable uh, by the layperson, that the, the noise maker knows if they're in compliance or not. Decibel ordinances are difficult in that sense because people don't have sound level meters and so they can't know if they're complying. Um, the, the final part in legal considerations, is it helpful in expensive, in expensive litigation? A noise meter is really helpful in expensive litigation. This thing, if you, if you take somebody to court and they got deep pockets, they're going to hire a noise expert and it's, it's going to get very difficult if you haven't got good measurements. And so that's where the sound level meter is actually a very helpful tool. And then prevalence, that one we're not going to worry about too much. That was what you saw before, just how, how many noise ordinances, how, many, how often they're showing up. In noise. But you hit the next button. So again, going back to this, let's just kind of look at the overview before we dive in. Next button. So the first, the blue there is, yep, is, is, is easy use. Then we got comprehensive. The next one is qualitative. And then that kind of purple shade is legal considerations. So just keep you focused on what's going on. Remember the left-hand side is the, the tools and now we're, or now, now the regulatory tools. And now we're gonna start looking, nope, go back one. Nope, there you go. We're gonna go look at this um, right here. Um, and um, we're gonna kind of start at the top and kind of just go down the list, starting with nu nuisance and disturb the peace. Go ahead and hit the next button. Now uh, one more. Oh, okay, and that's what the bottom looks like. That's the other ones. Um, I, let me just give you the overview. The next one after that was all the decibel-related ones. Those are ones that are just above the screen. Then there's a thing called the plainly audible standard. I, I want to encourage you guys to think about this because I think it's got great potential. Uh, finally, there are operational restrictions and uh, prohibitions. And again, that's got great potential. And uh, equipment requirements, I think that may have some application. Quiet zones, probably not. Go ahead, hit the next button. Okay, let's start with the, the top one, the nuisance. What is a nuisance regulation? It usually reads something like this. It, the standard is unreasonable and, and you, a person of normal sensitivities. Usually those are kind of the two key components. Is this, is, is this noise unreasonable? And is it is it a problem for a person of normal, reasonable or no, normal sensitivities? Um, this is the most common clause found in noise ordinances across the country. It's great for a party when you go out at two o'clock in the morning and say, "Hey, this is a little loud. Can you turn it down?" Um, it doesn't work well against a business because cops will never use this against a business. I just just I just don't see it. And you, oh, well, you guys aren't a business you guys, that you're dealing with. It's often a government. They're never going to use this against a government either. So this ain't gonna, this isn't gonna cut it uh, in pickleball too well. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the next one is is the oh, decibel-based ordinances, and this is quite a complex set. There, there, there's a lot of different decibel-based ordinances. It is not as prevalent as you would think. It's only in 59% of the ordinances of the 500 largest cities in the country. I think it, it is always problem, pro, problematic because it is expensive. It requires training. Um, police departments usually have very few of these things. And so you got a whole host of problems. However, I think it is invaluable at the same time because it is the only regulation that is reasonably comprehensive and will be proactive. You guys have all got a noise problem already and you're dealing with it. And, and so you're reacting. But the majority of the population doesn't have one yet. And so they're not reacting with you, they, but they need a proactive one that will protect them in the future if one of these facilities is proposed nearby. And so this really should be in your mix of any any time you're talking about it, you should be talking about a decibel-based ordinance. And let me uh, tell you what kind of decibel-based ordinance you want to be talking about. Go ahead and hit the next button. 
Okay, so um, hit one more. So right, yep, yeah, that's good. So the the, the the under the decibel based ordinances, the first thing I, yeah, the, the first distinction is there's there's two types of ones. One is a not to exceed, an absolute level. The other is a you can't make noise so many decibels above background, a relative number. You can work with both of those. Um, I'm going to focus on the first, not to exceed, because most communities use that, and I think it's simpler. Um, go ahead and hit the next button. Your next choice in a noise ordinance, and, and don't worry again, you don't have to be frantically taking notes or anything like that, because it'll all be summed up at the end. I just want to walk you through this, so you kind of can, when, when faced with a city councilor, you can, you can kind of say, oh yeah, we don't want to do that. We thought about that already. <laughs> That was not what we want. Um, so the next thing is this time issue. And there's there's four different metrics that I mentioned there. The first one is called a fast LMAX. Now, a fast response on a sound level meter takes a 125 millisecond, it's an eighth of a second chunk of time. And it averages the noise in that period of time and tells you the decibel level. The second one down, a slow LMAX uses a one second chunk of time. Okay, not an eighth of a second like the fast, but a one second. The problem with something like a pickleball is, is that the pickleball is probably got a, a duration of like, I haven't measured one, I'd love to. It's probably like 30, 40, 50 milliseconds at top. You know, what we're hearing is uh, it comes to a peak in two milliseconds and then degrades over maybe, I think, well, I've heard 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. But it degrades pretty quick, meter. too. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. And so, and so if you average that sound over an entire second, it's gone. Now, averaging it over an eighth of a second still ain't great. Yeah. But the problem is eighth of a second is the shortest time on the noise meter most likely to be owned by a police department. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, 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 the meter that will, that, that the police could use would be something like a 500 to $1,000 meter. The, the meter that would measure that every 10 milliseconds, let's say, is gonna be something on the order of you know, five to ten thousand dollars. Yep. Okay. So it's it's not um, something that the, the police are going to have. And so while this sounds bad and it is a compromise, it is much better than a than a second. Okay. <laughs> the next one, the L E Q, is an average, and it's it, it could be a one second average, but it's often more like a ten sec a ten minute yeah. average or an hour average. And those are just ridiculous because you average a pickleball impact over an hour and it's nothing. You know, a, a punch from Michael Tyson averaged over an hour is a love pat. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to be going there. If you see LEQ anywhere in a noise ordinance, that's just like red flags all over the place. And the final one up there is LN. That's a level that's exceeded. So a, a typical noise ordinance that would use that was would say uh, exceeded 10% of the time. So like you can only exceed 50 decibels 10% of the time. Again, that is a, a regulation that is not gonna work for a noise that has a duration of 30 milliseconds, right? 20 milliseconds, whatever it is. Um, so, um, Moving on to the next button down, the next question is in in a uh, in a uh, in your choice of decibel based ordinance is whether it's DBA or DBC or octave band. Now again, you can skip the octave band because that's a very expensive meter, very complicated, and you don't need to know what note is being played by the by the uh, um, by the pickleball players. But and, and so the choice is DBA or DBC. It really doesn't matter. Um, although DBA is the most commonly used one, DBC is useful for uh, low frequency noises, but you're not really dealing with that. So a DBA is perfect. 
So again, here, we're going to pick DBA on this one. The next one, um, you know, th think about this. I, I, I'm curious to hear from you guys, how many of you hear this within your home? Because if you do, yeah, raise your hand if you hear it within your home so I can kind of see. That's not perfect. Well, no, that's not perfect. That's terrible. But what that means is, is that an interior standard would work for you also. And, and so I would definitely consider having an interior standard in your noise regulations. The next two are having to do with motor vehicles and, and stuff like other stuff. So we can skip those. But here, yep, oh, 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 go slower, 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 slower. I want you to notice that the advantage of, of um, decibel-based ordinances is that they can be enforced by the police officers. That's the first circle. But the different disadvantage is that they're not easy to use. They're just, they don't meet any of my easy to use criteria. That's the second circle. Go ahead and hit it again. Next button. And again, we already talked about this. It's kind of a mixed bag on the uh, on the legal implications that you know the person making the noise doesn't know that they're in violation because they don't have a noise meter either. Okay, let's move on. To, there we go to the comprehensive. It here's its strength. This is the strength of a decibel based ordinance. It's usually fairly comprehensive. And especially if you select, for you guys, it's a fast, A-weighted um, sound level meter, you know, sound level metric, then I think you're going to be okay because that'll that'll do good enough. It'll do a good enough job with the with the impulsive noise. Go ahead with the next one. So, what level should you pick? This is from the EPA levels. This is a study the EPA did back in the 70s. I, I duplicated this with my study and found about the same results. So I've presented theirs because they're more authoritative than I am. Um, you'll see that um, about on the bottom, there are the decibel levels. You probably can't read what they are. Don't worry. Um, if you ever need this, just send it to me. Um, but the black dot at the very top, that's the most noise regulations. The number of cities with the, with the level is on the left and the decibel level is on the bottom, and that black dot is 55 decibels. So basically, if, if far right is 40, 45, 50, 55, if you're moving from right to left on that. And so daytime 55 is the most common level, nighttime level of 50, that's the uh, white squares and not the black dots is the nighttime levels. And so basically this is just, to give you a starting point. If you're in a rural community, you might take it down five. If you're uh, next to the freeway, you might move it up five. But this is a really good starting place to be right in the middle of the country in terms of decibel levels. Go ahead, next one. Next, The next uh, standard I want to talk about, regulatory tool, is plainly audible. And this is one I think you really should think about. It's It, it got its start with uh, respect to boom cars, you know, those cars that you can you can hear and feel before you can see them um, coming down the road. And basically it's, it said, you know, you can't, you know, if you can hear them at 25 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever your community adopts, it's in violation. Um, these are more popular than decibel-based ordinances in the country. They're easy to use. Um, all the police officer has to do is be able to measure distance instead of use a sound level meter. So just a tape measure, which they have in their police car already, um, or they can just pace it off if they don't have that and just make sure they go a little extra. Um, it also is what I call quasi-objective because our, our th unless you have hearing loss, our threshold of hearing is fairly similar. And, and so it gets rid of that subjective aspect of, of the nuisance-based ordinances that, oh, uh, you like it and I don't. Um, and it can be comprehensive. And that's what I want to show you next, hit the next one. So this is from St. Petersburg, Florida. This is their noise regulation. They basically use plainly audible in place of decibel limits. And they just put a distance that you can hear the sound at. And, and so um, I have a homework assignment for each one of you. I want you to go out to your pickleball court tomorrow or this week and walk away from it and and in a, in, a, in a direction that's open. Don't go in a way, walk away from it in a direction that's got houses or obstructions, uh, uh, 
and, and, and tell me how far away you can get before you hear it. If you don't want to bring a tape measure for this, um, find the coordinates of where you are using your cell phone and the coordinates of where the where the pickleball court is, and we can figure it out using uh, Google Earth. Um, but so there's an example of how to do it just in terms of distance alone, whether you can hear it. If you can hear it at that distance. And so it, it uses what a plainly audible standard does is it uses your threshold of hearing as a substitute for a decibel level, okay? Because our threshold of hearing is zero decibels, roughly. But we take that, um, and, and it might, and, and, and it will be higher in people with hearing loss or in places that are noisy, right? Because if the background level is 40 decibels, it doesn't matter what you, zero is your, hearing, your threshold of hearing, right? But just as you walk away, noise goes down, and, and you know you kind of like you can almost like tune these, so to speak, to a decibel level if you want by picking a different distance. And I'd love to hear from all of you what distance your pickleball courts disappear at. Can we? Um, I, I think we a few of us have that information right now. Do you want a, a, a little short discussion on that? Or go for it. Yeah, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute, and if you want to share your details. Um, I also wanted to ask you when you said walk away from it. No, the background noise. I keep hearing people say that the impulsive isn't, it's not drawn out by background noise. So, See what I'm saying? can you talk a little sure. bit about that? Sure. Yeah, you're talking about the issue of detectability. And you're right. Noise is detectable for a number of reasons. For example, if we go, let, let's say we all go out to a Mozart concert tonight. We go to a, here's some Mozart, right? It's got uh, some violins and some cellos and some woodwinds, and it's got a couple basses back there, and uh, and they're all cranking out. And let's say we bid our sound level meter out, and we, we the the sound pressure that we measure from everybody is yes. 80 decibels. Let's say you're a bright town. Now, that doesn't mean that because the violins are only, if we could listen to the violins only, let's say they would be 75 or so, 70 decibels. That doesn't mean we don't hear the violins playing. That doesn't mean we can't hear the cello playing. It doesn't mean we don't hear the drums when they come in, even though they are all less than 80 decibels, right? We can detect noises for a number of reasons. One could be the frequency, Impulsiveness can also impact our ability to detect it, can help help make it more detectable. So yeah, you can hear noises below the background, but that's the plainly audible standard takes care of that, right? Because either you hear it or you don't. And either the background wipes it out or if it doesn't. And that's why I really like the plainly audible standard is that it if it is audible and at one great place to have the plainly audible standard. You don't have to use this method. One great way to use the plainly audible standard is to say, you know what? It cannot be plainly audible in a person's home. So um, let's see if uh, anybody here can talk about the distance of their home. I'm about a hundred uh, feet away but my home is elevated, so the noise is distinctly heard in every room of my house, and we work from home, so it's an issue. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I, I have no doubt that at 100 foot, this is terrible. Um, I'm, 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 more, well, I'm, I'm more curious as to, like, can you still hear this at 500 feet or 600 or 700 feet? That's, but because cause at 100 feet, oh, my God, I mean, you're almost on the court, <laughs> you know? Well, it does go down as we walk away. I have, because I walk around that park quite a lot. So if I walk away in the park, I would say the whole circumference uh, of the walkway is around half a kilometer. So it's it's uh, it's audible everywhere in the park. Uh, but if I leave the park, let's say on a tangent and go towards the marketplace, then it tends to go down. Uh, my house though is like, 25 meters so i literally i'm, I'm actually hitting it now so <laughs> so oh, yeah 
So, so you, you said half a not twenty five meters, twenty five feet actually. Sorry, you said half a kilometer is is is. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean there is a there's a there's a small like uh, strip mall about half a kilometer from the coast, and once I reach the threshold of that, uh, I then then the noise is not there. Okay. But yeah, that's okay. That's perfect. That's helpful for me. Can I can hear uh, it about uh, five hundred uh, feet away, uh, not as loud and annoying as it is closer, but you can still hear it audibly. Okay. And I don't know if you've had a chance to research this, Wes, but we hear from the pickleball abutters, we call them, the people who live near ports, that the longer they're exposed to this, the more sensitive they are to it. Oh, for sure. Can you talk to them for a moment? So, so th this gets to, in, into your, you know, your, your response to it. People say that you know, humans have a number of responses to allergens, lots of different things like this, where like some people, you know, they become sensitized to things and it gets worse for them. Mm -hmm. Some people are, um, you know, people say, oh, I got used, I got used to the sound. I used to live by the airport and I got used to it. And what what they're really saying is that they consciously got used to it. but our physiology was has evolved over you know two million years well and, and more than that because we share the same the, the same biological architecture with you know all the mammals really i mean if, if anybody here has a dog who doesn't like fireworks and, and has seen the dog just petrified at fireworks you know you share that same um, biology, uh, underlying architecture. What's different between you and the dog is that you have a conscious brain that has some awareness that can go, oh, that's fireworks. And the dog doesn't have that, right? But our body still reacts the same way. When we were evolving as a species, <laughs> Noise was a warning signal. It was when something was going wrong. We use this all the time, and we, we we've developed this as a species. What does our kid do? Our, you know, our, our newborn, <laughs> or, or you know, our two year old, or whatever, when um, they need us, they cry, right? <laughs> and we respond. And so. The, what, what's been really shown in the last 20 years in the research, particularly around airports and highways, is that people say they acclimate to noise, but they don't really, because our body at an unconscious level still has that same response. It triggers our fight or flight response. So it gives you a shot of adrenaline. It gets your stress-related hormones flowing. Um, and, you know, it, it, it gets you kind of wired up. And, and so there is a cost to having that happen all the time. So I, and I want mention that a lot of us have uh, seen our cities contract for sound studies. And some of the acoustic engineers out there, all they'll say about impulsive noise is that it, quote, can be annoying sensitive people yeah well you know they're <laughs> they're being paid by the city so mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me right mm -hmm. <laughs> but i mean the, m impulsive noise okay gunshots pickleball noise um it's pretty clear that in this in the literature that impulsive noise is more annoying and in fact, this is actually worked into American National Standards Institute standards. It is more annoying than a steady state noise because it draws your attention. I mean, that's, you know, that's... You've described it like it's a warning. If you hear it in nature, it's a warning signal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or it's your alarm clock, right? I mean, that, 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 that's an impulsive noise, right? I mean, that's... It's it's meant to to wake you up to get you going, and and so 
one thing I was going to propose is that them. the best way to get a decibel based ordinance, especially since you're using a fast L max, which is still using a one eighth section time to average over, right? And remember, over this one eighth se second, that that pickleball spike is just a small little, you know, it's smaller than my finger, right? In the middle of that. So it's it doesn't yeah. fill that whole eighth of a second. So what I would recommend is that for impulsive noise, for noise that has a duration of less than a second, there'd be a five decibel penalty for that noise, meaning that the, the limit is not 55 decibels, but it's 50 decibels. And impulsive noise, I mean, it's just, it's in the literature. If you want me to fight, cite some things for you, I can't do it off the top of my head, but I can, I can definitely send you stuff, um, some resources that say that, that researchers repeatedly find that impulsive noise is more disturbing than a steady state noise. Very helpful. Okay, let's check the next one now. And I guess we gotta hit one more time to see where we're going. Oh yeah, that was the plainly audible. The advantage of the plainly audible is that it really covers everything. It gets an X everywhere. It gets my ease of use and my comprehensive, my qualitative, my legal considerations, it's all there. So I really like this one. And it's just a matter of adapting it, whether we adapt it saying, not plainly audible in your homes. And I love to use that because, you know, that's your home, right? <laughs> that's your little castle there. And, you know, these people don't have the right to be making noise inside your home. And I think it's a strong argument. And so I think it's, 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 a, it's a good standard, plainly audible inside the home. Um, you could also pick a distance. It sounds like from hearing the, the, um, uh, the 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 500 or the half a kilometer i have to do my math on on what that is but um but a kilometer is like a little uh, half a mile so it's a quarter mile so it's a thousand feet basically it's just roughly so a thousand feet um you know yeah uh if you're if if if, you're, if you're, what you're exposed to is a thousand feet away, that's okay. <laughs> you know, you can deal with that maybe. Yeah, we there's only three of us, four of us actually that are really being affected by tennis courts converted to pickleball. Yeah. We're sixty. We're I think sixty, seventy, and a hundred feet from the two courts they put in. Yeah. It actually seems closer because we have an easement right behind our house and we're elevated above it. And uh, we've already done a sound study, but we're getting absolutely nowhere. We're a private community. We're not on the city property. And that's the problem. Uh, it, we're fighting in a private community that had five tennis courts and now they converted to pickleball. And it was never put up to vote. It was done by the board without any approval. They sent out no questionnaire. But I didn't know what pickleball was. They sent out the questionnaire. So you're talking about going to the city, but it's a long path to go to the city to get them to change the sound ordinance. Right. You oh, know? it is. It is. And we are, and we are year round. We're in South Florida, so we're pickleball yep. twelve months of the year. Yep. Okay. And we. Right. Well, I missed the legal one. I had something going on with my family, and I had signed up for it, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been talking to a gentleman by the name of Charles Leahy, who is a lawyer who's getting involved in this, too. And he's given me a lot of advice. But there's a group of three of us. We haven't started any type of lawsuit or anything like that. We're just trying to do our due diligence before we do anything. But um, it's just it is deafening in the it is really obnoxious in our backyard. I mean, we're elevated up from the courts a little bit. I don't hear it in my house because I have impact windows. My next neighbor has big plate glass windows. They have everything in their kitchen and their bedroom, and they're they're ready to go full uh, full bull ahead to sue. Yep. But we've held them back right now until we get all our information together. Yep. Okay. 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 I just want I just want to throw those few things in. Just yep. you're talking about city. We're talking about private communities. Yep. Okay. It's a totally different thing. Oh yeah. HOA, yes. 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 
Okay, go ahead and hit the next one here. So operational restrictions too. I love this one too, because this is, the problem with these is they're not comprehensive. But the, the nice thing about them is they really work well. So in operational restrictions, like this would be, um, um, you know, time, well, go ahead, hit, hit the next button. We'll give, get some examples here. So you can see here, the examples are time of day, day of the week. Um, you can skip permit required. Yep. Yep. Okay, sorry. Time of day, day of week. Um, those, those would be the big ones. And then setback, which we've been talking about too. Um, you know, lots of regulations say don't do this within 500 feet of a residential property line, right? Again, this is probably going to be reactive because the problem with these types of restrictions is they are not comprehensive. And so you're not going to institute this until somebody's already proposed and put in a pickleball court, unfortunately. And then you're working from behind. Um, and then go ahead and hit the next button. Yep, that's the, yeah, one more. And then the equipment requirement. This is the one thing I was curious about. An equipment requirement, you know, is often like you got to have a muffler. And one possibility, possibility here is that it's got to be screened. And I'm curious as to whether that is effective or not. And I'm wondering if anybody has uh, a wall. And, and when I say screened, when, when you build a wall um, that, that makes us, that, that's going to be a sound barrier, it has to be much louder, you know, it has to block all line of sight. Can't have any gaps anywhere. No, you know, pick a fence type thing. That doesn't count at all. Um, that's like transparent. You know, you need a solid wall. It really doesn't matter what it's made of. It's just got to be solid. It's got to be tall. It's got a block line of sight by a lot going every direction, sideways and above, and it's got to go right to the ground. And I want to know if anyone's got one of these walls nearby and they can check to see how it how it does. Uh, you're you're muted, Louise. Sure am. Um, I just have a question about decibel levels. I checked my um, my courts are getting built. They're just um, portable, so that's not so bad. They're going to be multi-use with tennis, but they're 50 feet away from my house. Oh my god! And uh, the decibel, <clears throat> and it's 11 people on our street that are 50. 50 feet away. One house is 10 feet away. Oh my but um, the decibel levels at for our borough say 90 decibels at the property line between sunrise and sunset and 70 mm -hmm. between sunset and sunrise. And I had a um, consult with Bob Unitich and uh, originally it was for one pickleball court. Now I told him it was going to be four. And he was basically saying, you know, that they use the term decibels, not DBA. He said he can explain this all later, but tell your tell them that your consultant says pickleball sounds at your place will exceed 70 DBA fast mode and over 90 DB peak pressure all day long. So don't really understand that. So I don't know because you I'm know nervous what? about 90 being so high. Yes. So remember at the very beginning, I said noise ordinances can do one of three things, right? Functions. Yeah. And those regulations are designed to protect the noise polluter. There can be no yeah. other explanation. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I recommend that you um, email me and uh, we, we can continue us, this discussion offline and I can tell okay. you more. Great. Um, Thank you. So let's go on to the next one. I'm almost done here. Uh, yep, go ahead. Let's go. So again, um, I'm just wanting to bring this back to you that you really need to think about every regulatory tool you got. Go ahead, next one. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we can skip quiet zones. That really They don't really apply. Go ahead, one more. Keep going. There we go. Next step. So here's here's kind of my recommendations. 
Um, one is that you definitely need a decibel level. It should be in the range of 50 at day, 50, 55 during the day, 50 at night. Uh, slightly lower if you're rural, suburban. Um, you definitely want a five decibel penalty in there for impulsive noise. That the reason why I do this is this is the only proactive regulation that will help you. So it, it's the only thing that will help somebody beforehand. Because all the others are really targeted to pickleball or to recreational facilities. And so you, you, you've got to put those into the ordinance before the, the thing develops. And it's not going to happen most time. I mean, you're going to be behind the times. You can still work getting them in, but it's not going to help. So let's if we, sorry. Yeah. If we see an LAF measurement, we should add 5 dB to it. No. What I'm saying is, well, you should say that they should add a 5 dB. Yes. Right. To it. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so for impulsive noise, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Because right. we've heard, haven't we heard another engineer say we should add 12? Yes, that is the, yeah. that is the, I told you there's lots of research and 12 is the number they pick. Okay. You can add 12. Um, you can add 10. Um, but, um, what I am trying to do is think of what will easily, more easily pass mm -hmm. a city council here. Mm -hmm. And I think what you do is you say, look, the research and the literature says it's 12 decibels, right? All we're asking for is five. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's the reason for this. This is, this is, um, I mean, the same thing with picking 55, right? Is 55 a level? I want to live with? Not really. Okay. This, th this, both of these standards fall in that function of not really doing it for either, right? They don't protect the polluter, but they don't protect the polluted. Either. But like I was saying earlier, before we got started, in a way, the ordinance will be a cutoff point for when enforcement will step in. Right. If they go over the 55, you can call in a complaint and they can measure it. Right. And but but the other thing is, and and, and one thing you got to remember is that there are noise ordinances, and then there are zoning regulations, and you want to get this stuff in both, right? And the zoning regulation is important because that's what they turn to when they're trying to decide. So. One of my next. Well, let me just keep going down, and it'll become sure. clear what, where, where where all these fit. So again, noise not plainly audible at 500 feet. I think that's probably a good distance, based on what I was hearing people say. Um, and it's it's, um, you know, so basically what that does is, is it makes them move that facility 500 feet away from a residential property. I also really like. Oh, I lost my 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 bullet there. My the time of day re restrictions, right? Uh, and day of the week, and, and, and so you know, I like um, this. Uh, you know, no pickleball on the Sabbath type of thing. <laughs> you know, um, I want to just quickly read um, one thing from uh, the. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and unfortunately, oh wait, I don't even have it. I thought I had it right here. Uh, I can't. Well, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the early version of the, uh, it's the earliest version of the flood story from the Bible. And um, it, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, basically the reason for the flood was because of the noise of the people and the gods could not sleep. And so they decided to exterminate everybody. And, 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 and but, but it's sort of what we feel like. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Exactly. And, and it's like, you know, you guys, if, at, at the very least, you deserve a day of rest. Okay. And 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 whether you are, whether that be Saturday or Sunday, whatever whatever is is happening there, you deserve a day of rest. And um, you know, you should be trying to get that. 
Um, and so that's a, that's a day of the week restriction. Uh, obviously, you gotta you gotta really tamp down on the nighttime noise, and, and so you wanna you wanna bring that down to like six o'clock and stuff like that too. And then just with respect to the zoning, you know, that these things should not be permitted in a residential zoning zone district, and that you wanna just get into the zoning regulations. Quick question: Has you heard people complain about tennis courts? You know, As a rule? not a lot, a little. A basketball courts tend to get more complaints than tennis courts. Okay. But I'm I'm not getting a lot of complaints about tennis courts. You get a little, but um, nothing like pickleball. But the zoning is if it's a residential area with a little neighborhood park, it shouldn't become a regional pickleball center. Exactly. And what does must be screened mean? Well, again, that's the bar, the barrier. The ah. wall. There must be a, a, a wall between the... Even if it's and, and the way, more than way, 500 feet and, and less than 55 decibel? Well, maybe? no, no, this is just... I, I remember, I, I listed all the types of, of regulations that there are in the noise world. And I'm thinking, what of those regulations can we fit in here? And, you know, having a having a, a, a noise barrier between um, the noise source and the residential receiver that blocks line of sight, especially for second floor bedrooms, right? If you got like a two-story house and you're looking down, you want to be blocking that. And uh, um, again, you know, what, what, what these things do is they also help the designers pick a better location. Well, yeah, whole, because whole, e even if the court uh, if, 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 if it matches these other restrictions, if there is no s sound barrier, then people walking their dog or the little kids in the kitty park, you know, or someone who wants to read a book, no one's going to be able to do their normal recreation if they're just right next to a pickleball court. So, so basically, I'm just saying, you know, you know, it may be not everywhere that it can happen, but it, it, it seems like it's a, it's a technological solution. Could help. or partial solution and, and, and so you know let, let's 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 consider it you know you might not put it into your regulations but you might and and just you know it's another tool to have available so that that's basically my presentation um, and and so my, 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 my message going forward is is when you think about regulations don't think just one thing don't think decibel don't think distance don't think you know, that any one of these is what we need, because that's not what you need. You need everything, okay? Because that's the only way you get a comprehensive regulation to cover all the scenarios, to be proactive, to be reactive, to be, um, you know, to deal with, you know, impulsive noise, to deal with, you know, so like, a, try, you know, try to get everything in there, get that interior plainly audible standard, you know, that you should not have to listen to this in your house. You can go, Hey, look, I don't care if there's a pickleball court there. Okay, that's fine. I just don't want to hear it in my house. This is my house, right? I want to be able to sleep. I want to be able to watch the TV. I want to be able to talk to my family. I want to be able to have a glass of wine and enjoy my afternoon. You know, it's like, you know, this is my house. And, and uh, you know, let's just keep it out. And so I think that's a standard that you can get uh, legislators to adopt. Les, we can't thank you enough. This has been an incredible uh, lesson for us. I'm going to ask Rob to, to say his final thoughts. Um, but I wanted to remind everybody that the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse has a beautiful website. It's very easy to find. It's called nonoise.org. And uh, he, he could always use our support in uh, donations. Uh, we hope to keep working with you, Les, and maybe come out with a model ordinance so we can share with other people. Um, I'm going to um, ask Rob to say his final goodbyes, and then I'll stop our recording. We'll still we'll be able to say good, good night to one another, but I uh, really appreciate you being with us this week, Les. Well, thank you very much. Rob? What is the best way to package uh, what we're discussing to a legislator. Hmm. So, 
that's a great question. That's a whole discussion of its own. <laughs> I think the, the best way to package it, um, I think, I don't have a quick answer to that, but one thing I would do is I would have everything you want written down. I would have as much support as you can get. Um, and and it's, it's a challenge because like somebody said, there's only three of us that are next to this facility, mm -hmm. right? And, and so what happens is if you go before the city council or even if you go before your, 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 your community and it's three of you and there's a hundred users, you know, you're outnumbered, right? And that's, that's the problem of noise everywhere is that noise decreases with distance. And so any one issue is always going to be outnumbered, you know, Plus, unless it's like a, a, an airport, right? Uh, unless it's something like, you know, a, a great big airport where, you know, there's a million people around. Yeah. You're yeah. always outnumbered. And so the packaging is really important. And I think it has to do with empathy. And it's like, listen, you, you couldn't live here with your family. You could not, you know, lie in bed on a day when you're you're sick and not feeling well and hearing all day long you know that that you just couldn't do this and so i i think because you're outnumbered the message has to be one of empathy and and, and, for, and so part of the packaging i always tell people to select the person with the best sense of humor to be your spokesperson because anger doesn't sell. Anger is the appropriate response to being exposed to noise. But the trick is, and it's really hard, because what does noise do but drive you crazy? And that doesn't leave you to be level-headed. But you need somebody with a really good sense of humor to be your spokesperson. Because anger doesn't sell. It's the empathy that you have to sell. That that and and so you really have to be careful how you how you package it like you said how you how you portray it because it's it's so easy after you know you just got woke up at 6 a.m by you know the pickleball people right and and you know <laughs> you you were wake, working late last night and now you got to talk to your city council member or, or whoever and you're not going to be called and so it's not a good time to do it you know you got to do it when you've been rested pick somebody who's who, who's you know well-rested, good sense of humor, can can treat it with a little humor, but still seriousness too. Uh, you know, the humor helps diffuse it, but the uh, the empathy is what you're going for. It's really great advice. Yep. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll see you. Uh, oh, I did want to briefly say that next call is going to be with Ivan Anderholm. Very excited. He's the uh, Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Oswego, Oregon, and that'll be on August 25th, and we'll make sure to invite everybody. Good night. Thank you so, so Good night. much. Thank you, Les. Thank you.